Okay, so time to get started. So, uh, uh, change of variables is a new uh, topic for today. And um, it's actually something that, in a different form and with a different name, you have seen before. Um, it's uh, the substitution rule. So, you, hopefully, presumably, you guys are all familiar with the substitution rule. Um, what I want to do is, as I often do, start off with the old familiar concept and just uh, change our point of view on the old familiar concept. And uh, with that new point of view on that old familiar concept, we'll be prepared to sort of extend into a, um, the multivariable uh, context. So the, the rough idea is that we're going to take the point of view that we find ourselves dealing with a domain that is undesirable. And we've seen some of those, right? We, so, for example, when we uh, wrote down a triple integral representing... Um, um, uh, our nested integral representing triple integral of a ball, a solid ball. Uh, we had square roots everywhere, right? Highly undesirable. It's going to make for really ugly um, integration. So um, wouldn't it be nice if we could find a sort of a different way around that? And the goal is to rewrite an integral over a bad domain as an integral over a different domain domain. It's going to be a different integral. It's going to have a different integrand, of course, right? But hopefully, ideally, a different domain. So let me show you where, uh, where you've seen this before. Again, it's a substitution rule. Um, here is uh, the substitution rule, as you have probably seen it before. I hope that looks familiar. Um, here, uh, I've written it uh, as the uh, substitution rule for integrals. Uh, this first up here, this is the substitution rule for antiderivatives. You notice these are not integrals; these are antiderivatives. Right? Um, this is a substitution rule for integrals, and uh, in particular, notice that the bounds for the dt integral and the bounds for the dx integral are different, and well, as they should be, right? Because their t and x are not the same variables. These being the values that you're plugging in, they should be different because you're plugging them in four different things. Uh, one way that you could um, oops, that you could write this is that uh, this on the right here, for example, you could view as okay. So the antiderivative capital F of x, and you evaluate from g of a to g of b. Uh, whereas on the left, your antiderivative, keeping in mind you're talking about antiderivative with respect to t, not x. Antiderivative is f of g of t. This is the function uh, which, when you take its t derivative, gives you the integrand. So, therefore, that's the antiderivative. And there you plug in a and B, and notice that you get the same thing on both sides, the purple and the blue give the same expression, even though you're plugging in two different, or two different pairs of values, because again, you're plugging them in four different things. Here, A and B are going in in place of T. G of A and G of B on the right are going in in place of X. Different antiderivatives, different plugging in numbers, and in the end, then the same expression, thus making these things equal. Okay, so that's an old point of view on uh, the substitution rule. Here's the new point of view that I want to encourage uh, that we're going to uh, take advantage of and use to apply this in a multivariable setting. And that is, let's think of uh, that we have a separate x-axis and a separate t-axis and that this algebraic relationship between x and t, I want to think of as a function whose domain is the t-axis and whose target is the x-axis. Um, so these two different integrals then, let me get this on this down. These two different integrals represent integrals over two different domains. This first one, I already forgot what colors I used. Okay, blue. Uh, this is an integral happening on the t-axis from A to B. So that's an integral that's taking place on that domain, whereas uh, this is an integral on the x-axis from g of A to g of B. Well, that's uh, here to there. So we've got two different domains for two different integrals. 
And um, alternatively, then, I could view this as if you are looking at this integral, which takes place on this domain, and if you should decide, for whatever reason, that you don't like this domain and you'd like to rewrite the integral that, that's currently in this, uh, on, on this domain, if you'd like to rewrite it as an integral on a different domain, then the substitution rule says, yeah, sure, no problem. You can rewrite that as an integral there on the t-axis from A to B. So you can view the substitution rule as a, a tool that allows you to rewrite an integral defined on one domain instead as an integral on a different domain. Now, that's, again, that's a point of view you probably haven't taken before, and why would you? Um, usually, when we use the substitution rule in single variable calculus, our motivation is not the, not the domain. The domain is just the numbers that you plug in at the end. That's the spiking of the football in the computation of an integral. Um, usually, the big challenge is the, um, the, the integrand. Right? Making the integrand something where you can use established integral rules to figure out what that antiderivative is in the first place. So it's a weird point of view, but it's going to be an important point of view. Okay. Is everybody on board so far? Does everybody see what I'm talking about here? We have two integrals defined on different domains. Okay. So um, now you've probably seen some proofs, a proof, hopefully at least one proof of the substitution rule. Um, I'm going to give you a different point of view again on uh, how to do this. Uh, what, what I, in fact, I just showed you kind of a proof uh, a few minutes ago. Um, well, let's think, uh, take a different point of view on this. And that is, let's think about this integral. And remember what an integral is. An integral is a Riemann sum. And Riemann sums are where you take the domain, you chop it up into little pieces, and then, for whatever reason appropriate to your application, you're going to multiply the size of each piece times the value of some function. Okay, so let me indicate that on here. For each subinterval, and let's talk about this one, you're going to multiply the size of the piece times the value of uh, you know, some function. I'm just going to say uh, f, whatever our integrand function is. So you're going to multiply this times that. And then you're going to add up over all the pieces. Okay. So here's the idea. It's a pretty clever idea, actually. I'm going to say fine, but instead, let's look at that little piece. If this piece is the image of that piece, instead of looking at this product and thinking of, oh, whoops, wrong color. Instead of thinking of this product as something that I associate to this little piece of this interval, I could instead say, look, uh, this product is what I want to associate to that little piece of that interval. I'm still adding up the same stuff. I'm still adding up this times that and adding up over well, effectively, all of these pieces, I'm just sort of thinking of them as happening over here. But I'm going to be looking at the same sizes and the same values of the function. So, said differently, I just want to rewrite the, these things. I'm not going to change the things. I just want to rewrite the things in terms of t. And most of that is uh, pretty straightforward. Most of that is just a matter of plugging in. And let me skip down to uh, where, what this uh, looks like. Um, If I want to rewrite the value of the function f of xi, well, uh, let's see, where did I put it? Here it is. f of xi. Well, x is g of t. So uh, the point is, is rewriting the, the function is just a matter of plugging in what you know about the relationship between x and t. In some sense, you're not even really doing anything. This is just, well, you were given that x is g of t. Stick it in there. Nothing happened. Okay. What's interesting, though, is how, and where it's, you know, we have to worry is what do I do with delta x? How do I deal with this size? 
How do I relate that um, to uh, something uh, over here? How do I relate that to the size of this piece? And conveniently, there's a really simple uh, relationship between the size of uh, delta T and the size of delta X. And this comes from a flashback to chapter two, uh, chapter the derivative chapter. I guess that's chapter four. And here it is. The, the flashback is to remember that you can think of that as a change in the input. So how big that little interval is on the t-axis, you can think of that as a change in the input. You can think of this as a change in the output of that function. And the relationship between input changes and output changes is the derivative. So let me color code this a little bit. Uh, this function, input changes, output changes, the output change, so how big this interval is there, I can rewrite as the derivative of the g function times delta t. So let me uh, zoom out a notch here. So all that's happening here, all that's happening in rewriting delta x as g prime delta t is I'm just interpreting these two intervals, the sizes of these two intervals as uh, changes to the input and output variables and changes to the input and output variables are related by the derivative of the function. So punchline then, um, let's look out, let me zoom back in. Uh, this integral the x integral that, ha that went from g of a to g of b, um, I can rewrite then by noticing that, uh, again, that is the same as that. And this now is the same as that. And then just by moving parentheses around a little bit, this expression, can rewrite as that expression. Note all I did is move these parentheses over like that. It's just a regrouping. <coughs> Punchline is uh, this is an integral. This is an integral where you're adding up this integrand times uh, these sizes. Uh, that's a Riemann sum. Note it's a Riemann sum. It's an, uh, an integral dt. And in fact, it's exactly. Uh, this integral here uh, that we wanted to uh, rewrite the, uh, the, the original integral as. Okay. So there's a certain number of details there, and so don't get lost in the details. The punchline, uh, the important fact here is that I'm just realizing that when I rewrite, when I have all of this stuff that's happening over here, and I want to rewrite it in terms of stuff happening over here, most of that, I mean, most of that is just plugging in. You know what the G function is, just rewrite the X's in terms of T's. That is the G function. And the one detail you have to keep track of is what I like to call the stretching factor, namely how much bigger is that interval than that interval? What is that factor that relates those sizes? And that factor is G prime. Yes? So how do you know that T and X are related? Well, that's given. Yeah, so this is uh, pre uh, presumably uh, given in the statement of the uh, uh, in the statement of the question. Yeah, so that's a choice. Uh, in other words, uh, if you have some integral given to you, you're allowed to just make up some new variable called t and say, well, this x. You know, I'm looking at this integral here, and I, I don't know how to deal with this integral, so I'm just going to choose to let x equal oh, I don't know uh, cosine t. Free country, you can just make that up, right? It's just a choice. And so I'm just uh, um, explaining here once that choice has been made, you know, so given that choice, um, what, um, uh, what is the resulting sort of algebraic consequence? Yeah. Uh, 
All right, so this is, again, single variable calculus, a different point of view on an old result. Let's see how we can uh, adapt this to our multivariable uh, setting. Uh, again, we're going to pretty much try to do the same thing. Um, we're going to figure out how to adapt the integrand so that I can rewrite an undesirable integral as a different integral over a different domain. And it's all going to come down to figuring out what the stretching factor is. In other words, how much bigger is size of the output compared to size of the input. Okay, so let's see what this looks like in R2. Um, here's, here's the ugly situation that we might face. Um, man, that is not a good-looking domain, is it? I mean, think about how you would slice this up. How would you write this? You know, a double integral over this domain, how would you write that as a nested integral? Well, it wouldn't be a nested integral, it would be several. Because no matter which way you slice, well, there's a corner that you're going to slice through, for example. Uh, this corner you're going to slice through. Um, looks like, tragically, you'd end up slicing through that corner there. So at, if, you, if you do your dy slicing on the outside, you're going to have four separate nested integrals, and that's awkward. And also undesirable slicing the other way. So here's the hope. The hope is that some way or another, we'll talk about you know how to come up with this function g um, somewhat throughout this section and somewhat throughout the next section in various ways in the rest of the course. Um, hopefully, we can view that domain as being the image by way of some function, the image of a more desirable domain. And you'll notice I've drawn a rectangle here. These are the best domains you can possibly hope for because then the integral bounds, the nested integral bounds are constants. And life is good. Right? Okay. So fingers crossed. Wouldn't it be great if we could rewrite an integral on this nasty domain instead as an integral on this much nicer domain. And see how this is exactly analogous to uh, what we did in the uh, this point of view on the substitution rule. We had an integral on that domain. And by viewing that as an image of a different domain, we could rewrite uh, an integral that was given here. Uh, whoops an integral that was given here, I could instead sort of rewrite the integral as a new integral over there. Um, by the way, I just have a um, little bit of terminology. Um, very often this is called this process of when you have a function going one way uh, and then effectively a different thing, in this case an integral that's defined on this domain, effectively kind of going backwards. Uh, we call that a pullback. So um, the integral had been here, and effectively it gets pulled backwards through the g function to turn into an integral over here. Anyway, it's a common uh, construction. comes up in a lot of different um, situations in that. Okay, so that's our goal, and the question is, can we do this? Uh, suppose we're given, by the way, uh, this g function. We'll worry about where to find it uh, later. But given such a g function, again, most of it's not that big of a deal. If, for example, if x's and y's are your outputs, where u's and v's are your inputs, anytime you find yourself looking at x and y, you can instantly rewrite x and y in terms of u and v. And here are your explicit instructions for how to do that. x and y are the outputs, the g outputs of you know, this function g that's written in terms of u and v. So that's just plugging in. Just like in the single variable case. You know, the actual variables themselves, you just plug in what you're already given. And the challenge comes in in trying to figure out how the size of that little piece, in this case now keep in mind we're talking about double integrals, so size means area. How does that size relate to the size of that little piece? Again, an area. So 
Um, let me, uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so are we trying to equate the one on the left with the one on the right? No, nope, we're not equating them. We're trying to relate them. Right, so they're not the same. Critically, they're definitely not the same. Right? I just want to know what's the relationship between that one and this one. And it's just like in the single variable case. I wanted to know what's a relationship between delta t and delta x. They're not the same, right? The, but one's an, in, one's an input change, one's an output change, and they're related by way, in this case, in the single variable case, they happen to be related by the derivative. I just want to know what's the relationship in this case now. And that's we're going to have to do some work to figure out what that relationship is. It's not immediately obvious. Okay. So... Um, here's sort of an exploded view of those little pieces. So this little thing there, there's an exploded view of it. Um, likewise, this little thing there, here's an exploded view of it. Um, even though this is an area and this is a different area. I'm going to sort of get my foot in the door on figuring out how to deal with these things by looking at changes, vectors that relate to these objects. So in particular, let's look at that vector describing the sort of bottom edge of that rectangle. That's a change. That represents in the UV plane the process of uh, starting here and ending there. It's a, it's a, it's a movement in the UV plane. Well, when you move in the inputs, you're going to get a corresponding movement in the output. And we know how to relate these two vectors. This input vector, that output vector, they're related by the derivative. They're related by the derivative transformation. So, um, uh, it, oh, color problems. Um, that input vector and this output vector are related by the derivative transformation. So we have to apply the derivative transformation to that vector to see what we get. Uh, now, good news. Um, that's a scalar, so it factors out. And further good news, the remaining directional derivative is a partial derivative. So it's an easy calculation to see what, you know, uh, given for this input vector, what's the corresponding output vector. Apply the derivative. We have these various rules, scalars, factor out, and when you have a standard basis vector, that gives you a partial derivative. So we've got a formula for how to compute that output vector. Uh, you can do a very similar analysis on that input vector and its corresponding output vector. And then the question comes up, given those vectors, how much area do you have there? And uh, uh, here we end up going all the way back to chapter one. Uh, I have a parallelogram. I want to know the area of that parallelogram. I know these two edge vectors. This is an R2. How do you find the area of a parallelogram with two given edge vectors in R2? Well, it's uh, got a little formula. You take these two vectors, you make them the columns of a matrix, and you take the determinant. Um, so that's this calculation here. The first edge vector, you uh, make the first column. The second, oops, wrong color. The second edge vector, you make the second column. And the area is computed by the absolute value of the determinant. The whole chapter one fact. Um, uh, that scalar factors out. This scalar factors out. And all you're left with is uh, this, uh, this determinant here. By the way, you all might recognize that little matrix. Oh, whoops. That little matrix is exactly the Jacobian matrix. Sort of a weird, seemingly weird coincidence, but um, to zoom in. Here, first column, we have the partials with respect to U. Second column, partials with respect to V. And that is the exact 
definition of the Jacobian matrix. So really nicely then I have a um, uh, uh, I have my stretching factor worked out. The stretching factor, the absolute value of the determinant of the Jacobian. Because notice that relates the area of the rectangle that we started with and the area of the parallelogram that we were trying to compute. So this green determinant, this is the factor that you multiply by input size to get output size. And therefore, this green Jacobian determinant is a stretching factor. So this is this Jacobian determinant is playing the role then kind of like the derivative in the substitution rule. In the substitution rule, you know, the output change and the input change were different. They were different by a factor. That factor happened to be the derivative here. That factor is not just the derivative. It's the determinant of the Jacobian, the derivative matrix. Okay. So altogether then, here's what you're change of variables rule looks like. If you want to rewrite an integral that's given over one domain, if you want to rewrite it over a different domain, rewrite the function in the obvious way. If x and y are g of u and v, then yeah, sure, plug that in. No trick there. You just plug in what you're given. Um, and then you just have to remember that the areas are related by a stretching factor. And that stretching factor is that Jacobian determinant. Said differently, you can change the domain by way of a change of variables function just by, in some sense by just uh, plugging in. Just don't forget that when you do that plugging in, you have to introduce this factor. Again, it's a relationship of the areas, relationship of the size uh, of the pieces of the domain, and there's an easy formula for it. Okay, so let's see some examples. Um, by the way, here's all those same arguments written with differentials instead of deltas. Uh, it's uh, representative of the exact same argument, just in sort of a, uh, arguably more elegant language. I like to sort of show it to students in the first instance with deltas because then you feel like you're really seeing these actual little tiny little vectors. I find it a little bit more relatable, but it's the same argument uh, down here. Okay. So here's our first example. Uh, I want to compute that integral over this domain R, which looks like this. And I think I can persuade you without too much trouble, that's a very undesirable domain, right? Look at it, it's all cornery and wiggly and bumpy. You're going to have to break this up into multiple pieces, whichever way you slice. Three, in fact, so highly undesirable domain. Okay, now in this situation, that domain is given just right here in the statement of the problem, that domain is the image. It's the image of a much more desirable domain, namely the unit square over here in the UV plane. And furthermore, here's the function. I'm just giving you the change of variables function right there. So uh, this uh, really is just going to be an example of how we plug into the change of variables formula um, to do a change of variables problem. Uh, you know, now, again, how to make clever choices about what the domain, the new domain is going to be, what the change of variables function is going to be. We'll talk about that in increasingly uh, uh, as we go along. But in this one, it's a freebie. There it is. So let's plug in. Uh, keep in mind we're given that we want to compute this integral. Note that we have an integrand there, x plus y. We have this domain, this really ugly, undesirable domain. Okay, let's rewrite it. Uh, we know from the change of variables formula that we're going to need to know this stretching factor. I'm going to need to know the determinant of the Jacobian of the g function, the change of variables function that we're given. So let's compute that first and get that uh, out of the way. Uh, so here we go. Uh, this change of variables function here. Here's its Jacobian matrix. Now that's a, uh, a little 
quick exercise to let you guys remind yourselves how to compute a Jacobian matrix. Um, you have output variables that are given as functions of input variables. The columns are the derivatives one at a time with respect to the input, the different input variables. So take those partial derivatives, assemble them appropriately, and you get this. Make sure to check me on that. Make sure that you can reproduce that, uh, that calculation. Um, the stretching factor is not just that matrix. It's the absolute value of the determinant of that matrix. Multiply usual formula, right? Find that determinant, and you get uh, this expression, uh, which is awkward. It's not 4uv minus 9, tragically. It's the absolute value of 4uv minus 9. And uh, you can't just throw those absolute values away. That's critical to what this stretching factor is. Because that's how we compute areas of parallelograms. That's you know where this sort of came from. So what do you do? How do you deal with these absolute values? We certainly don't want to leave those absolute values in the integral because we don't know how to take antiderivatives of absolute values. It's weird. It's highly undesirable. So what you have to do here is remind yourself what these u and v are. The u and v that go into that expression. Well, here they are. There's u and v. u and v are these new uh, variables for their uh, uh, variables for our new domain. And look what our new domain is. Our new domain is the unit square. And I can tell you exactly what u and v are. u always is between 0 and 1. You see it right here in this picture. Right? v is also always between 0 and 1. And because of that, because of what I can see about u and v in that picture, I can tell you right now what 4uv minus 9 is. Let me make this work. 4uv minus 9? 4uv could never be any bigger than 4. That's the biggest it could possibly be is 4. So 4uv minus 9 is definitely negative. No doubt about it. For all of the values that we care about, 4uv minus 9 is negative. And the absolute value of a negative number is the negative of that number. So the absolute value of 4uv minus 9 is 9 minus 4uv. Now let me pause on this for a second. Does everybody see what happened there? Any questions? You got, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so which, um, which area are we computing? We're not, so we're computing an integral, right? We're computing uh, this integral idea is our goal. And it's just that I have to know in the process of computing this integral, which I want to rewrite, you know, it's given as an integral over here. I want to rewrite it as an integral over here. I need to know what the stretching factor is. You know, what's the proportion of sort of the input areas and the output areas as I stretch out that new domain to become the old domain. Does that make sense? So the right is the Jacobian? Well, no, I, I'm computing the Jacobian of the function. All right, so um, that function that relates the, the input domain to the output domain, that is what you're computing the Jacobian determinant of. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, so that's not actually drawn? Uh, what's not actually drawn? Uh, like that, you know, parallelogram. That we're like oh, yeah, that's, uh, I don't have to draw the picture because I, I, the point is I already know from our previous analysis of a picture that we drew what the, the final punchline formula is, and that punchline formula is this. So that's an every time. Anytime you do a change of variables, that formula is always the same. Correction, anytime you do abs uh, change of variables in R2. We'll talk about R3 in a few seconds. Um, absolute value of the determinant of the Jacobian, and then it's just like you just plug and joke. Yeah. Right. Um, right. So there's your Jacobian determinant. Uh, now look how the integral breaks down. X plus Y, our given integrand. I just rewrite that as very literally X plus y. Uh, look at this. Our old x, x is given as u squared plus 3v. So x is u squared plus 3v. I didn't really do anything there, right? That's not like a magic trick. I just plugged in what I'm given in the description of the function, what I'm given about x. And likewise, 
this y there? Well, y is given as v squared plus 3u. So I just do what I'm told and plug that in there. And so again, nothing really happened in that part of the problem. I just plugged in for what I know about these x and y variables and it rewrote them in terms of my u and v variables. Okay. Where the interesting part happens is with the Jacobian. And so again, uh, uh, the Jacobian is how you rewrite dx dy in terms of du dv. That Jacobian determinant is the factor that you kind of have to stick in there to make that work out. So that Jacobian determinant, again, was computed there. Plug that in like so. And uh, lo and behold, we have a new integral. This now is the integral. Uh, whoops, let me zoom out a notch. That is our new integral over this new, much more desirable domain that will allow us to compute the other, much uglier integral. Everybody see what happened there? Um, okay, next example. Yeah. Well, so altogether, what I what I really did is observe that the absolute value of four uv minus nine is nine minus four uv. So uh, you can't look at these terms individually. Unfortunately, the absolute value of a sum of two terms, you can't just look at one term at a time. And you've got to look at the whole. And um, by the previous argument we made, 4uv, being as it is never bigger than 4, 4uv minus 9, that whole thing, negative. And once you know a number is negative, its absolute value is the negative of itself. Does that make sense? Because the absolute, for example, the absolute value of negative 5 is the negative of negative 5. Uh, so yeah, this wasn't a one term at a time calculate. Yeah, exactly. Okay. All right, so let's see the next example. Um, I want to compute that integral. And my domain is a square uh, with those four vertices. And uh, I've made a nasty domain there. I mean, it's a square. It's not that bad, but if you think in terms of, if you, if you don't use change of variables, and if you think about if that's your domain, you're going to do a nested integral, then however you slice, you're going to be hitting corners. All right? And it's just unavoidably bad things are going to happen, and this, for example, would end up being three separate nested double integrals, which uh, seemingly triple the work, and nobody wants to do that. Even if you slice it the other way, likewise. So the idea is to notice, and here is one where I'm going to suggest that we notice for ourselves, without it being given, uh, what the change of variables function might ought to be. Let's ask the question, can I naturally and reasonably view this square as being the image by way of some function of a more desirable domain? And the, the observation to make is that, yeah, sure, it's a rotation of that square. If you take this green square and rotate it counterclockwise around the origin by a certain amount, you get this blue square. So this is an image of that, and this function is just a rotation function. Right? You see the, the sort of clever uh, clever observation, but it's a clever observation that you've now seen, and so you can uh, do this kind of trick in the future. Yeah. So these two are equal. No, not equal. There, this one is the image of that one. The, I mean, you see the difference. So I mean, so, so one of these is one of these is easy to slice up. I don't run into any corners when I slice up the green domain. So that's a nice domain. This is an ugly domain. Because uh, when you slice this, when you hit corners all over the place. So they're not equal, but they're related by way of that rotation change of variables function. Um, 
Right. So conveniently, rotations, uh, we talked about rotations back in Chapter 3 in the linear algebra um, section. So there's uh, the matrix for the linear transformation that does this. And if you write this out as a function, uh, oops, write this out as a function like so. And if you take its Jacobian determinant, uh, And there's a certain amount of arithmetic involved there, and very nicely, that Jacobian determinant ends up being 1. By the way, let's sanity check before we go on. The stretching factor, the amount that this function, uh, the amount that this function stretches areas turned out to be exactly 1. And that's highly geometrically satisfying. Let's think in, you know, geometrically what happens when you uh, do this function. When you take a uh, region in the, in the UV plane, if you just rotate it, there's no stretching happening. There's no, nothing weird, nothing. It's just, it's a rigid motion. And very plausibly, areas should stay the same when you rotate. Is that good? Oh, is that what you meant when you said they're they're the same? Yeah. I'm sorry. I yeah. So the the uh, the areas, yeah, the areas are the same. So okay, great intuition. I just I didn't pick up on what you were saying. So what so, about for the one before that I asked about? So l let me just summarize what we said here, though. So so now, critically, these two domains are not the same. The domains are different, but they have the same areas, and you know, sort of region for region. The stretching factor is one, and so even region for region, the areas are the same. So there's no stretch at all. There's there's effectively no stretch. I'd rather say the stretching factor is one. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, right. Okay. All right. So now let's uh, press on with the calculation. Uh, keep in mind what I wanted to compute was uh, this integral. So I'm going to rewrite that integral. x squared plus y squared is this. Now, again, notice not that much happened here. x is given in our change of variables function as that. So all I did is plug in for what I was, where I, I guess what I decided, you know, from my change of variables function, what I wanted my change of variables function to be. I decided already what x is, and there I just plugged it in. And then ditto. Uh, here, what is y? Well, y, again, having chosen my change of variables function, y is that expression, and I'll just plug that in there. So that part of the problem, nothing is really happening there. That's just rewriting, making a, you know, based on your existing choice. Um, the interesting part is how we deal with the areas dx dy and du dv, not always the same. There's a stretching factor that relates them here in a nice coincidence. Yeah, that stretching factor is one here. They happen to be the same. Um, the point is I do have to stick that stretching factor in there to observe the acknowledgement of how I turn dx dy into du dv. OK, so all of that having been done, look at this bear of an integral I've given myself, but if you multiply it out, just look at the integrand, multiply it out, collect terms, blah, blah, it turns out to work out really nicely. And that's an easy integral. That's an easy integral in particular over a rectangle, in particular that rectangle. Easy to work out then. Everybody on board? Everybody happy? Okay, so one more example. Now this is a weird one, but this is a surprisingly common one. Uh, here I have uh, an integral that I want to compute. There's the integral I want to compute. It's an integral defined on this region R, and the region R is bounded by four separate curves. Four separate curves. Okay, so x, y equals six. Uh, x, y equals ten. Uh, 
xy squared equals 5 and xy squared equals 7. So you can see that those four curves, <coughs> they, uh, they curve in similar ways, but importantly different in the details. And the punchline is, the, in some sense, the two purple curves kind of cut through the two blue curves, and they then make a, a region, this bounded region R. And let's suppose I want to do an integral over that bounded region. Side note, um, uh, this if specific example is a kind of a cleaned up, modified version of a calculation that comes up in a very important way in thermodynamics calculations. So those of you who are engineers or physics majors, you will be doing integrals at some point on shapes that look like this. So this is, a, this is not an arbitrary weirdo manufactured example. This is kind of natural. Um, right. Okay, so uh, how do I do this integral? Well, um, I certainly don't want to do it directly. Right, look how ugly that domain is. There's a corner there, and there's a corner there, and so you can see whichever way you slice, you're gonna have at least three. Let's not go head on on this problem. Okay. So the clever idea is to observe that these two curves involve a function of x and y that are, that's the same function. And so I'm going to use that function of x and y to define a new variable u that is x, y. Now, it, where, what I do with that, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute, but just arbitrarily, let me just make this choice. Similarly, these two curves involve Again, this a, a shared same function x, y squared in this case, and I'm going to use that to define a new function v. That's that function of x and y. So between the two of these, I now have a change of variables function. I have a function defined by what's written here. Right, that gives me a relationship between x and y and u and v. And the weird thing about this, the sort of unfortunate, un slightly unfamiliar thing about this is the function's going the wrong way. Right, see how I draw the arrow going to the left? I don't have x and y given as functions of u and v. I have u and v given as functions of x and y. Cool. Okay. Nevertheless, um, let's look and see what these curves look like on the other side. Uh, this, these two curves here, for example, uh, x, y equals 6 and x, y equals 10. Well, if x, y is u, those curves on the, other, in the, in the left side here become u equals 6 and u equals 10. So those two curves become those two curves. Uh, similarly, these two curves here, given that x, y squared is v, become v equals 5 and v equals 7. So good news, the, uh, this weirdo region that I'm dealing with, I have a change of variables function that helps me relate that weirdo region this region, which is not at all a weirdo, that is a rectangle. Again, awkwardly, the change of variables function is going the wrong way. But still, I've got this region related to that region. Okay. So, it's going to turn out that this is all we really need. Um, let's compute the Jacobian determinant of that function. Why? We'll get you know what we're going to do with that Jacobian determinant. We'll talk about in a moment. Let's, for the moment, let's just compute it. And that Jacobian determinant is uh, here's the function h, and the Jacobian determinant is uh, here it is that. <coughs> now, what do I do with that? What what is this Jacobian determinant? Well, looking back up here. Uh, again, I have to acknowledge the function is going the wrong way. So what I've computed is a stretching factor this direction. And 
What I need is the stretching factor of the other direction. So said differently, I have here a formula that tells me how to compute these little bits of areas as a stretching factor times those little bits of areas. So said differently, I have UV area written as a stretching factor times XY area. Oh, whoops. Sorry. So that's what I know. This stretching factor that I just computed is what I multiply by XY area to get UV area. What I want is the other thing. I want to know what do I multiply by UV area to get XY area. Said differently, I want to rewrite XY area. I want to rewrite XY area in terms of U's and V's because my goal, again, is to rewrite all of the XY stuff in terms of U's and V's. So the way I do, do that then, it's a pretty straightforward little punchline, is because of that, solve for dx dy and you get that your the actual stretching factor you're interested in is simply the reciprocal of the stretching factor you computed it's pretty plausible if you think about it right i mean if you compute um, how much of a stretch there is going that way uh, reversing that going the other way you're undoing a stretch and the undoing of a stretch is a squish so geometrically, I think, pretty satisfying. Okay. Uh, so then uh, it's all over for the algebra. Uh, keep in mind, this is what I wanted to compute. You rewrite this as this integral. So dx dy. It's 1 over v du dv. Uh, now, luckily... And this is an awkward note, but uh, x squared y cubed, I can rewrite that as u times v. Now, that's just a clever observation that uh, you look at u and you look at v and just observe that uv is x squared y cubed. We got lucky that it happened to turn out that that's uh, is something you can write down. In general, you have to play little algebraic games and try to figure out how to rewrite uh, your expression here uh, in terms of u's and v's. And it's different every time, uh, but uh, it worked out nicely in this case. Uh, so it's, it's going to be an algebraic challenge. One of the algebraic challenges you'll face in these problems. Um, so all that being said, though, our integral, the v's cancel, <coughs> and I'm left with that integral. And that's an integral over uh, this rectangle in the uv plane. And so that's an easy integral. And I'll let you guys work out the details. Let me see how that works. Okay. Let me show you a way to keep track. Uh, this argument in here is a little confusing when the function's going the wrong way, and it, sometimes it's easy to uh, look at a relationship between variables and maybe not be clear in your mind which way is the function going. It's just something to keep track of. Um, it's a wonderful notation that will do the work on that for you. And that's what I have introduced on the next page here. Um, the equation that we derived earlier was this, that the way I relate xy areas to uv areas is by dividing by that Jacobian determinant that we computed. So recall uh, this notation. where I write Jacobian matrices as um, uh, a sort of a fraction of partials. Okay. Um, in general, though, this is a statement about how Jacobians work. Had I been able to solve explicitly for x and y in terms of u and v, then this is just a straight up direct, this is how you relate x, y, I, x, y areas to uv areas. Just uh, this Jacobian relationship. So what I have then is two different relationships between dx dy and du dv, and therefore these two things here are equal. So this is the the nice little um, convenience, and that is that when you write your Jacobians 
in this form, uh, it keeps track for you of, um, of, wait, do I multiply or do I divide? So said differently, what this equation is telling you is that you can treat these Jacobian determinants like they're fractions. They behave like fractions when you write them with this notation. So if you are given, let me write out how we would apply this in the uh, previous setting. Uh, if we are given, as we were, um, u and v as uh, functions of x and y, when I write down the Jacobian, I'm taking the partials of u and v with respect to x and y. So the Jacobian determinant that I computed is that. Right? What I wanted was a relationship. I wanted to be able to write uh, dx dy as something times du dv. Well, the thing that you multiply by dx dy to get du dv uh, excuse me, the thing you multiply by du dv to get dx dy is that. I'm set differently. You can see that uh, what I need is partial xy, partial uv. What I can compute is partial uv, partial xy, and so take the reciprocal. So the notation kind of does the work for you. The notation keeps track for you of wh whether you should multiply or divide. Are we going forward? Are we going backwards? So I love this notation. I think it's very, very convenient and useful, and I strongly encourage you uh, to, uh, to uh, why am I erasing it, uh, to uh, use that. Okay. All right, now, um, what about if we have a triple integral? Same deal, you might have a wildly undesirable domain for a triple integral. For example, this is a wildly undesirable domain for a triple integral, right? Um, what would you do? Well, if you can rewrite it as the image of a more desirable domain, such as a rectangular box like I have here, um, then you can play a similar game. Now, th there's a, uh, a highly analogous computation that goes through and figures out the stretching factor here. It is highly analogous, so I'm going to leave this as an exercise for y'all. But the, the main idea is that um, the box in the UVW space is described by three vectors. Each of those vectors has an image. They're all computed with the derivative transformation. They're all uh, relatable by way of uh, partial derivatives. How do you compute the volume of a box? Well, it's with uh, a determinant of a 3 by 3 matrix and it details details. The punchline ends up being that the stretching factor, uh, the stretching factor is again your Jacobian determinant. It's a really nice uh, uh, punchline that uh, again very analogous to the two-dimensional fact. So very easy to remember because it's it notationally identical. Okay, so I'm gonna let you guys read these details. I think it'd be a really nice exercise to read through these R3 uh, calculations. Um, uh, make sense out of these calculations by analogy from what we already talked about with the R2 calculations. Uh, and then here's your rule. Again, your rule is just insert a stretching factor and that's what your stretching factor is. Okay. All right, um, and there's an example here that I'll let you all read. It's uh, very similar to what we've already done. So. Okay, I want to move on and talk about symmetry theorems. Um, you all have seen a symmetry theorem in the past at some point. Uh, does that look familiar, I hope? You may remember this result. So if you have an integral, going a single variable integral, if, not big if, but if, the integral from negative a to a. In other words, if you have a symmetric domain. And furthermore, if you are, your, an, your integrand is an odd function. And that's a critical requirement, right? Remember that what an odd function is, uh, an odd function is a function where f of negative x is negative f of x. So odd here doesn't mean weird. 
Right? Odd means that it uh, behaves kind of like x to the n with odd exponents. So, so there's two requirements in this theorem. You need, first of all, you need for the function to have this special property of being odd, and you need for your domain to have this special property of being symmetric over the origin. And in that case, when these two conditions hold, awesome result. This integral you want to compute, for which you're fearing the possibility you might have to compute an antiderivative, which might be nasty and in effort. Uh, no, don't bother. The integral is zero. Walk away. Right? Awesome theorem. Everybody happy with this? Okay, so for example, if you find yourself looking at the integral uh, from negative three to three of uh, you know uh, e to the x squared um, uh, sine of uh, x cubed uh, cosine squared of x dx, well that would be a bear of an integral to compute. My gosh, I, I, wow, right? It'd be nasty. I'm not even sure this is tractable. But, go to a little bit of trouble, think it through, persuade yourself this integrand has this property. That is an odd integrand. Uh, furthermore, the domain here is a symmetric domain. Integral is equal to zero. You don't have to compute any antiderivatives at all. Everybody see why this is awesome? Really cool fact. Okay, so it turns out there are analogous results in uh, the multivariable context. Uh, they're, the, uh, they're a little bit different looking, so you're going to have to bear with me while we define some terms. But there are some similarly convenient, powerful uh, results in the, um, in the uh, multivariable context. So first I have to define what we mean by a reflection. Uh, whoops. So a reflection is this. Given a point, there's the reflection of that point over that line. So, everybody see what I'm talking about? I mean, it's geometrically pretty satisfying. It's, it, if you were to think of L as being a mirror, and if you were at X, you would see your image, your, the ref, your reflection in that mirror as being at this point. So, that's called a reflection. Um, and using reflections, we can define some multivariable analog of the terms that we used above. Namely, there's a multivariable version of what it means for a set to be symmetric. And there's a multivariable version of what it means for a function to have odd symmetry. So these are those definitions. Uh, let's look at these one at a time. Um, for a set to be symmetric, I need... Whenever you have a point in the domain, I need the reflection to be in the domain as well. In other words, you have to have sort of a Rorschach test. Right? Does everybody know the Rorschach test? Yeah. Okay, so if you haven't heard of the Rorschach test, it's where you take a piece of paper and you just kind of throw ink all over, wet ink all over the paper, right? And then you fold along a crease and unfold. And the point is, if there was ink on one side that puts ink on at the reflection point on the other side of the fold, and so if there's ink in any spot on the result, there is also ink on the other side. So you get a symmetric picture. And I don't know if they still do this, but they used to show these Rorschach <coughs> diagrams or pictures or whatever they call them uh, to people and ask them, what do you see in the picture? And then try to interpret meaning from... You know, if someone says, I see a butterfly, that's, that's good. But if, you know, if someone sees something creepy, then that maybe that's bad, right? <laughs> so they, there used to be theories about that. I don't, I don't know if they still do it anymore. Okay. So that's what we mean by a symmetric domain. Let's see, did I draw one here? No. I guess I didn't draw one. Let me draw a quick symmetric domain. Now these are hard to draw. Forgive me for the bad picture here, but... Um, if your line is like that, here is a symmetric domain. Um, yeah, that's terrible. Let's try that again. Um, I have a 
symmetric domain. It's kind of like a guitar body, right? So point in the set, the reflection also in the set. Okay, odd symmetry. Well, odd symmetry means that the value of the function is the negative of the other value. The function is the question of well, which other are we talking about here? Instead of talking about the negative, we talk about the reflection of the original point that gives rise to that minus sign. So it's kind of analogous, right? If, um, if you think about it, in a single variable case, a, uh, if you look at a number and it's negative, uh, as the number moves, it's negative. It, they're reflections of each other. Right. All right. So uh, that being said, um, here's our first. I'm going to go back to the R3 stuff in a second. Uh, but here's our theorem. If you have a domain that is symmetric over a line, And furthermore, now again, it's very important, you also have to have a function that has odd symmetry. Very critically, the line of, of symmetry of the domain and the line of odd symmetry of the function, these have to be the same line. So three requirements, symmetric domain, odd symmetric function, and furthermore, that those symmetries are realized over the same line, um, then uh, the result is that the integral is zero, and you don't have to, you know, slice it up, you don't have to think about doing a change of variable, nothing like it's just integral zero, done, walk away. Everybody happy? Right, um, and uh, let me uh, show you the argument here for why this is true. Uh, here we go. So keep in mind, the domain is symmetric, so it is its own reflection. Now, again, it's one of our requirements. You need the domain to be symmetric. So if it's the same, if d and r of d are the same, then of course these two integrals uh, are the same. Now, let's look at this integral, and notice now, uh, this is where change of variables kicks in. I'm doing an integral over a domain that is the image of a, I'm going to say another domain, happens to coincidentally be the same domain defined. The point is, is it's the image of D. So, I have an integral here that is ripe for being rewritten with the change of variables formula. And so specifically, uh, I can rewrite this integral as that integral using change of variables. Um, x thought of as part of the reflection is the reflection right. uh, of uh, uh, thought of as part of here. Let me do this color code. Thought of as part of d. Um, areas. There's a stretching factor. I'm going to have to figure out what the relationship is. Um, the what's the stretching factor uh, proportion of areas between you know when you do a reflection. Um, I would argue that when you do a reflection, if you think about it, just like with rotations, you know when you rotate, areas don't change. Well, likewise, when when you reflect. Areas don't change. There's no magnifying happening here. There's no stretching or anything like that. A reflection is a rigid motion, right? So that stretching factor naturally should be one. Um, the function being as it is odd, you get this minus sign. That minus sign factors out, and lo and behold, this integral that we're interested in is its own negative, and therefore the integral has to equal to zero. So there's the uh, there's the argument, a pretty cool little argument. And notice that it's a very quick application of change of variables, but we get this very powerful result that under certain conditions you can just declare an integral to be zero. <coughs> very nice.
Nice. Um, let me show you a couple of examples. So let's look at uh, this one here. So I want to compute a double integral. There's my domain. Excuse me, there's my integrand, and there's my domain. Um, so now uh, this could get bad. Right? If, you, if you take a brute force head-on approach to this problem, look at your domain. It's a unit disk. It's round. When you slice it up, square roots are going to appear, and that's annoying. Okay. So here's the thing, though. Um, the disk, I draw a picture here. That unit disk... Is highly symmetric. So not only is that is that disk its own reflection over, let's say, the y-axis, right? But that disk is also its own reflection over the x-axis. It is also its own reflection over the line y equals negative x. It's a highly symmetric domain. So uh, I've got lots of symmetries to work with now. Now that's not enough. Can't emphasize enough. You, it's not enough to have a symmetric domain. Very common mistake students to make. They're like, oh, the domain symmetric, integral zero. Absolutely not. You need a symmetric domain and you need the integrand to have odd symmetry. So we have to look at this integrand and start worrying about uh, how does this, ref how, what happens to this function when you reflect over what lines. So um, now, the tip-off that I'm going to observe here on this function is that there's an odd power of y. So in the process of trying to decide what line do I want to reflect over, what do I want to be my, my, um, uh, my symmetry line, uh, odd symmetry line for this function, I would like to take advantage of that odd exponent. In other words, I would like for the reflection of xy to, uh, I'd like to be plugging in a negative y. I'm plugging in a negative y, I can see I'm going to get a negative 1 cubed, that's negative 1, and there's the negative 1 that I need. Okay. So, in what way, what line would I reflect over to turn y into negative y? Right? Well, if I want the point x comma y to turn into the point x comma negative y, I'm reflecting over the x-axis. It's a little confusing. I mean, it's, you, a lot of students would say, oh, you want to turn y to negative y, you're reflecting over the y-axis. And that's just not the geometry at all. Okay. So you've got to think it through. Be careful about it. Reflecting over the x-axis turns xy into x negative y. So uh, let's pause and uh, remind ourselves what we have now. Um, the function has odd symmetry, we see. Uh, but critically, the function has odd symmetry over, th uh, whoops, over this line. Um, I need for the domain to have symmetry over that same line. And thankfully, it does. That, in fact, the domain is symmetric over all sorts of lines. We already made that observation. We had a lot of sort of flexibility to work with there. So therefore, um, uh, I can just uh, conclude that the integral is zero, and I'm done. We have odd symmetry of the integral, we have symmetry of the domain, integral zero. Everybody good? Okay. Now let me show you a warning. Um, uh, students make a mistake. This is a very common mistake, and it's a dastardly little problem that you have to worry about. Um, and that is in applying symmetry arguments a little too quickly and a little too casually. So let's look at that function, at which point you're thinking, oh, right, same function. This function's got odd symmetry. I can see this one coming. We're going to apply a symmetry argument. This integral is going to be zero, right? And then you remind yourself that, oh, well, now I have to check the domain. The domain is a triangle with those vertices. Let's draw our picture. Um, I guess I have more room over here. The domain has vertices at uh, 0, 1, negative 1, 0, and 1, 0.
And you look at that domain and say, oh, hey, that domain, that's a symmetric domain as well. Very tempting to say symmetric domain, function has odd symmetry, therefore the integral is zero. And that's wildly wrong. And the critical problem is that the symmetry line for the function, it only has one symmetry line, and that is the y-axis. Right? The function's odd symmetry line is the x-axis. There's only one odd symmetry line for the function. There's only one symmetry line for the domain. They're not the same line. So you, there is no symmetry argument here. Um, in fact, uh, if you look at it a little bit more carefully, you think about, well, what, uh, what's really going on with this integral? Look at this function. The function, um, if y is positive, as it is there, look, see that y is always positive. If y is positive, this integrand is always positive, and you can't have an integral of a positive function being zero. Right? There's nothing to cancel. So um, can't use a symmetry argument. One last little quick observation, uh, and this is just a sort of a, uh, I want to emphasize how important this point is. It's very tempting to use symmetry arguments. I love symmetry arguments. I think they're great. Um, but if you, in this second example, if you say this integral equals zero by symmetry, and if you, you know, go through this calculation and everything, the point is, is that your answer is wrong. But furthermore, your argument is not only invalid, your argument also makes no progress toward the actual solution of the problem. The actual solution of the problem involves some other technique, maybe a change of variables, maybe uh, something else. So you haven't made any progress. And therefore, it's basically impossible to give any partial credit. So on an exam, you have to be extremely careful with symmetry arguments. They sure make a problem easy if they are valid, right? But if it's, if it doesn't apply, it's a uh, it's a zero. I mean, a score of zero, not an answer of zero. Sorry. <laughs> so so be careful, right? Be, think twice, double check, think it through very carefully before you apply a symmetry argument. Okay, um, that's uh, that's it for today. Oh, um, let me. There's a few more examples. I want to encourage you to read those. There's also a three-dimensional version of symmetry. It's just like the two-dimensional version of symmetry. I'm going to ask you to read through that uh, for yourselves. And uh, we'll call it a day here. Uh, see you guys later. <laughs>